and follow along with me as I read from Jude, verses 17 through 24. There's only one chapter of Jude, so it's the first and last chapter of Jude, chapter 1, verses 17 to 24. Let us hear these words. But, dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit... Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now, and forevermore. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we gather here in this place this morning, and perhaps we have carried heavy burdens with us into this place, concerns for those that we love, concerns for ourselves, the hurts and the fears and the doubts of these weeks and days and years. Lord, we gather in this place and we gather at the foot of your table and we know that it is not through anything that we have done that we are able to gather here, that we are worthy to receive what you have prepared for us. Not any bread, not any word, and yet you give so freely. Your grace pours out upon us that we might Not only receive bread from your table, but the word from your mouth into our hearts. And so now open up our hearts that we might receive what it is that you have for us today. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Easter was a couple of Sundays ago now, and I wonder if it's been long enough for you. Because it certainly feels like it's been a long time for me. The meaning and the power and the poignancy of Easter begins to fade quickly, it feels. The candy is already gone at our house from that day. There's only one basket left sitting on the table as I wrote this message, and I wasn't quite sure it would still be there, but I just haven't gotten around to throwing it out yet. So it's there still. The celebration and the feast seem like such a long time ago. And I wonder... I wonder if that's how the disciples felt. I wonder if after Jesus' resurrection, after Jesus' ascension, when they were told to go back and just wait, if that's how they felt. Such a long time ago. And I I feel like they may have even asked themselves a few times, is this real? Did that really happen? Sure, it says they devoted themselves to prayer, but they also devoted themselves to waiting, to waiting around. And sometimes, let's be honest with ourselves, waiting around with nothing to do is one of the hardest things we can do. It is precisely in this space where our minds and our lives and our hearts start to get cluttered up with junk, I think back to the Israelites who were following Moses in the wilderness. I mean, come on now. They saw a pillar of fire. They experienced the parting of the sea. And then they got to a mountain. And Moses ascended to this fire on top of the mountain. And as they waited, they said, oh man, he's not coming back, is he? Was that real what just happened to us? And Aaron said, gather up all your gold. Let's make a God we know. Maybe that's the God that delivered us. They were literally just saved from death and despair and bondage by God. 
And yet, after a couple of days, their minds and their hearts drifted away back towards something more familiar. You know, it seemed right to them at the time to make a golden calf, that new God. Everyone else was doing it. They had come from a land where they worshipped idols, and they probably passed through areas where people worshipped little things like that, and and they were headed to a land where, where people had stuff like that. So if everybody I know is okay with that being God, why am I not okay with it? I guess that's God, right? So everyone they knew was somewhat like them, and they were worshipping this. And so Moses comes down from that mountain, and he blows a gasket. Understandably so, because you have just been delivered from death and torment under Pharaoh in Egypt, and the God, the real God, did that. And yet you still want to worship this fake God. This God that brings you nothing nothing but death. God is leading you to life in the promised land, and you would rather have this fake God of death than that. And yet they did. They turned their back. They turned their backs to God as if it's an inevitable part of life to worship something else, a God of death. But we do that too, don't we? Let's just confess it together right here, right now. Two Sundays ago, the power of life, victory over the grave, all of it, it felt so real and it felt so powerful and it felt so palpable and so meaningful. But my question is, how long did it take you? How long did it take you? Because if I'm being real with you, if I'm being really real with you, it took me until Easter dinner Sunday night for me to be totally drained and to give in to thoughts of inadequacy and hopelessness. Powerful resurrection celebration at light of day, hopeless by dark. And it happens that fast. I hope it didn't happen that fast for you, but it can happen in our lives that fast. In the scripture from Jude this morning, he writes of the disciples, warning that in the last times there will be scoffers who follow their own evil desires, And it sounds like he's saying those people are out there. But if you really read it, I think what he's saying is be careful that that person's not in here. Most of us, even the best of us, cannot help but follow our own flawed thoughts, our own evil desires from time to time. It's not just people outside the church who we are told to point at and beware of. I think it's a warning to us individually that much like those first Israelites, it doesn't matter how much you think you've seen God do. Be careful you don't forget about the God that's rescued you. It's me, too. Because anything can become a God to us. Hopelessness and heartache and yearning and failure and success and power and fame and fortune hurt anything that is bigger than us can become a god to ourselves. All we have to do is look at the religions of the world and we know it's true. We can make literally anything into a god. Yet in this passage today, we also have this word from Jude to those who read it, who recognize it, and who find themselves in the midst of it. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Now, I don't necessarily have the exact same understanding of eternal life as everyone else, but I had no problem being ordained in the Methodist church, so I must be close to where everyone else is, I guess. I feel it's just a little bit more nuanced than waiting around to die before we get it. That this eternal life we have been given through Christ is at one and the same time an already not yet experience for us. We, who are like the disciples who waited around and probably asked some questions and wondered, and who knows what else, when Pentecost came around, they received the Holy Spirit. 
And that's the same Spirit that was in Christ Jesus, we are told. And like them, we have received this same Spirit. And so we have already received the power of eternal life that is alive inside of us. But we have not yet passed from this life to the resurrection life. We don't have the fullness of the incorruptible. The reality of death is still out there. And anything bigger than us, anything beyond us, can and will become an idol. Will become a god, maybe, to us. But we know it's really just a god of death. Because it's not the God that gives us life. One of the many faces that appeals to each person in their own way. Most of us hand ourselves over willingly and without knowing it to one of these. And some of us, even if we do know it, we can't stop ourselves. And really, we just look at human history before and after Jesus. And it's clear that even when we know that we're handing ourselves over to something, we cannot stop ourselves. So how do we rectify that? How do we fix that? How do we live as people, as post-Easter people, in the reality of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us? How do we live when the world tells us to die? How do we live our new life in Christ when the world shows us such gigantic obstacles and challenges, such shiny and attractive, alluring, consuming objects? How, how do we live this new life in Christ when we are consumed constantly by doubts and fears. We are already made new and whole in Christ. We have this life which is in us now that we can grab a hold of or so we are told, but where is it? Why hasn't it shown up yet? When's it going to get here? And in the meantime, am I certain that this other thing over here isn't bigger anyway? Yeah, Jesus rose from the grave and Jesus conquered death and Jesus ascended into heaven. Jesus has won the victory, but where is my victory? Right now. Right now, when I can't seem to break myself out of this cycle, this cycle of following all the wrong paths and of hurting myself and other people, of devaluing the life that I have, of prioritizing or chasing money or fame or whatever it is, where? is that new life. Because it would take a miracle, if I'm being honest with you. It would take a miracle every single moment of every single day in my life to know that the last time that I messed up and the biggest time that I messed up in my life before that, that this life that Jesus has experienced is also meant for me right now. Every minute of every day it would take that miracle. What I find most amazing about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the miracles that he did and the miracles that he is, and the ones that he is still in the business of doing, is that the same resurrection life that flows through him and moves in us through the presence of his Holy Spirit is that miracle. The scripture from Jude today reminds us to snatch others from the fire. This, after exhorting us to wait for the mercy of the Lord, Jesus Christ to bring us to eternal life. This eternal life we believe through reading the rest of scriptures, I believe through reading the rest of scriptures, is already planted inside our hearts and our minds and our souls because it's the same spirit that is in Christ that is in us. And so we experience all of this pain and we experience all of this brokenness and we experience the hurts and the failures and the trespasses and the loss and we experience the temptation and all of these things can become gods to us so easily and there are many faces of the same God and that God's really just death and that's no God at all. Now we know that the fallen forces and powers of this world, all these idols and gods that we make ourselves, they have no power over Christ. Because in Christ's death and resurrection, he broke their hold even on us, especially on those who live and believe in him and have that assurance of the Spirit within them. But we don't always remember that that's the way it is. Because that's the truth. 
While we have built up idols and obstacles and made our own gods that really lead us straight to death, we've built our own God of death, we have forgotten that it is the Lord of life within us, not the Lord of death. And so we get timid, and we fall back, and we get afraid to face uncertain futures We get afraid to face the struggles and the challenges and the temptations and the odds that get stacked against us because we allow ourselves to believe that this God of death that can grab a hold of us is just too big for us. And you know what? It is too big for us. But Jesus allowed Himself to crawl into that grave so that He could wrestle with it for us and all the powers of death and hell and all the forces of destruction, everything that would wrap our souls and our minds and our hearts in chains. He went down into that grave and they could not keep Him there. They weren't strong enough. The grave had no chains to hold Him down. The power of sin could not overcome Him. And He looked into the, the face of death on that resurrection Sunday and He said, not today being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and having this promise alive in our hearts and lives today we know that there's going to be temptation and doubt and destruction maybe devastation and anger and heartbreak addiction or illness or even the face of death itself staring at us and tearing at us ripping at us pulling at us and we can forget all too easily because it's so overwhelming and if we're not careful It feels so far removed from that Resurrection Sunday experience that fills us with power and joy and grace and excitement. But because His Spirit is alive in our hearts, it doesn't have to be that way because He wrestled in that grave and won not just so that He could win the victory, but so that we could win the victory. He wrestled in one so that the miracle that we need to face down that many-faced God of death every single day in our lives could be achieved through us because of Him in Him, with Him, through Him. The miracles we need to constantly happen are already constantly happening in our lives to this very day. And we might experience failures and setbacks, and inevitably this mortal body is going to pass away, but that doesn't take away from the miracle already alive inside of us. So what do we say to the God of death? Not today. What do we say to the death of broken relationships? Not today. What do we say to the God of the death of fear? Not today. What do we say to the death of addiction? Not today. What do we say to the death of failure? Not today. When the stone rolled away and Jesus walked out of that grave, he gave us the greatest and only not today that we're ever going to need. The life to which his resurrection bore witness and was opened up for us that day lives in us today and every day. There is nothing that can hold us back from eternal life in Christ because Christ has already seized a hold of it for us. And when we feel overwhelmed by what is in front of us and the odds are stacked against us and our minds start spiraling into failure, we need to remember that it's not our spirit that's able to do anything, but Christ's Holy Spirit that says through us, not today. Jude ends his letter to the disciples with these closing thoughts that reveal the absolute majesty and brilliance of this power of Christ alive in us. He writes to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before His glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. To the one able to keep us from stumbling because you know what that's not me i can't keep myself from falling over my own two feet and to the one who can present us before him without fault or blemish or brokenness lord how is that possible how only you can do something like that and in beauty and in great joy how do you look at me how do you look at us and see beauty and joy but you do That means wherever you've been and whatever you've done and whatever you've faced, the only God who saves us to Him belongs all glory because He's the one doing it. And all majesty because it's His work in us. 
and all power because it's His words that speak through us and all authority because He's the one that looks that God of death in the face and says through us, not today. And not just not today, but not ever. For all ages, now and forevermore, He looks at us and He says, you're mine and I'm yours. And with that and with it, whatever you're facing, whatever challenges or fears or failures, whatever mighty conflicts past that you've been through, whatever fresh wounds you've carried with you today, whatever doubts you've collected along the way, I want you to know it. I want you to know it. And I hope that you can say it with me in your own hearts and minds, even out loud. I know it's crazy. But to whatever death you're facing down, say it with me. Not today. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you today and we are grateful for the life you've given to us today. We are grateful for the gift of eternal life, the assurance, the joy, the hope you've placed in our hearts, the power to overcome our obstacles and face down our fears. Lord, in this time and in this space, let us reconnect and know your spirit alive and living in us and through us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.